the fact that the economy has been in a technical recession mm. even before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And um, the COVID-19 pandemic obviously just deepened um, a pre-existing condition in the country. Mm. But we also know that four months ago, the president um, announced um, the economic reconstruction and recovery mm. plan, mm. which is really government's plan um, to take the country forward, to begin to activate um, all the key sectors, all the subsectors that create um, employment, mass employment. And one of those subsectors are manufacturing, and the other one is agriculture that has the potential to really create massive employment. And we would also remember that the president, in his address on Thursday, um, also spoke, uh, make an undertaking that government will ensure that it, 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 it uh, 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 you know, it, it implements a process for massive increase for, for local products. Yes. That and we government know that there are so many people, so many local um, SMMEs that have collapsed uh, during the pandemic. So what then happens to those people? But the president is actually saying that the plan itself, the economic and reconstruction and recovery plan is really a plan to localize production. And it's so to look, localize, to localize the, the activation of the one, economy. One, one other thing, uh, uh, very uh, uh, important, uh, that was uh, highlighted by the President, was uh, the, the, the Cabinet-approved policy uh, mm. of 40% uh, mm. uh, uh, of public procurement, of, uh, public procurement going mm. to uh, uh, businesses that are, are, are women-owned, mm. you know, which, uh, mm. which must have come as, as, as great news. But uh, as my colleagues in the Citro, the mm. uh, President made, made those uh, pronouncements. And it mm. is for this parliament uh, and mm. its committees to ensure through uh, uh, oversight mm. Uh, mm. that those undertakings that were made uh, by the President on behalf of government are, are then uh, implemented. Yeah. Just from, yes. from, a, from, a, from a business perspective as mm. well, I think it's important to just emphasize um, that the president also undertook to address the structural constraints of the economy. Mm. And that is all of those barriers that really reinforce um, old patterns of ownership in the economy. So um, the president has also made a commitment that there is a team of people, uh, the National Treasury, as well as the, the president's office, um, where this project called Vulindela will, mm. be, will be spearheaded to ensure that all the structural constraints are addressed. But I think, um, Valerie, hold that thought for now. We will pick it up from, from after, after the next link. We are now going to go to a link that really speaks to issues of SMMEs and the activation of the economy. Last year, we undertook to create a larger market for small business and designate 1,000 locally produced products that must be procured from small, medium enterprises. As the COVID-19 pandemic forced the closure of global value chains, we have been able to speed up the initiative as the local supply chains become more open for locally manufactured products. To this end, Cabinet approved the Small Medium Enterprise Focused Localization Policy Framework, which identified 1,000 products. Furthermore, the Department of Small Business Development and Trade and Industry and Competition are supporting small and medium enterprises to access larger domestic and international markets. I've been very impressed with the work that these two departments have been doing. These efforts are supported by robust manufacturing support programs. In the State of the Nation address last year, I said that our vision for industrialization is underpinned by sector master plans to rejuvenate and grow key industries. Four master plans that have been completed and signed to date, which are part of the social compact between labor, business, and government and communities, have already had an impact in their respective industries. Through the implementation of the poultry master plan, and remember, our poultry industry was under a lot of stress. What the poultry industry needed was to have a master plan, which would have, should have been arrived at, and it did, it did happen. 
on a compact basis. Now we're seeing progress in that industry. The industry has now invested 800 million rand to upgrade production. South Africa now produces an additional 1 million chickens every week. Now that is great progress. The Sugar Master Plan was signed during the lockdown with a commitment from large users of sugar to procure at least 80% of their sugar needs from local growers. Now through the implementation of the plan last year, we saw a rise in local production and a decline in imported sugar, creating stability for an industry which employs well over 85,000 workers. Support for black small-scale farmers is being stepped up with a large beverage producer committing to expand their procurement sharply and focusing on the small medium enterprise producers. Now, since the signing of the clothing, textile, footwear, and leather master plan in November in 2019, the industry has invested more than half a billion rand to expand local manufacturing facilities, including small medium enterprises. We have worked closely with the auto sector to help it weather the pandemic. By the end of the year, the sector had recovered around 70% of its normal annual production in difficult circumstances. Last week, the Ford Motor Company announced a 16 billion rand investment to expand their manufacturing facility in Swanee for the next generation Ford Ranger Bucky, which they will export around the world to well over 150 countries. Now, this investment will support the growth of around 12 and more small medium enterprises in the automotive component manufacturing, an area in which many black-owned small businesses have never really entered. Now, through this initiative and this investment, we are going to see a number of small medium enterprises, largely in the Pretoria area, Mamelodi, Isteras, and places like that, coming to the fore and becoming active and being productive. Nearly half of the procurement spend on construction of the bulk earthworks and top structure of the Tswane Special Economic Zone during this phase is expected to be allocated to small medium enterprises. And I was told that it would be more some 200 medium enterprises and the value could well be something like 1.7 billion rand in procurement opportunities. Toyota has invested in their KwaZulu Natal facility to start production of the first generation hybrid electric vehicles to come off a South African assembly line. Now this follows investment announcements by Nissan, Mercedes-Benz and Isuzu in expanded production facilities, all of which cement South Africa's position as a global player in auto manufacturing and the biggest on the African continent. This year, our focus will be on getting the industry back to full production, implementing the Black Industrialist Fund and working on a new platform for expanded auto trade with the rest of the continent. Now, a number of countries on our continent are already setting up their own auto manufacturing plants. But they are going to be relying on South Africa to supply them with various components and a whole lot of other products that, have, that go into building cars. Now, this will be the part of our concerted effort to boost our manufacturing sector 
which has been going down. This year, we will begin to harness the opportunities presented by the African Continental Free Trade Area, which came into operation on the 1st of January following the adoption of the Johannesburg Declaration by the African Union. The AFCFTA provides a platform for South African businesses to expand into markets across the continent and for South Africa to position herself as a gateway to the continent to address the deep inequalities in our society, we must accelerate the implementation of broad-based black economic empowerment policies on ownership, on control, and management of our economy. That is a policy that must be implemented, and there is no reversal on that policy whatsoever. Last year, government agreed to landmark deals with companies that will advance black economic empowerment by transferring ownership to their workers. In November last year, we held our third South African Investment Conference to review the implementation of previous commitments and to generate new investment into our economy. Even under the difficult economic circumstances, the investment conference managed to raise 108 billion rand in additional investment commitments from a number of investors. Together with investment commitments confirmed from the two previous investment conferences, we have now received 773 billion in investment commitments towards our five-year target of 1.2 trillion rand. This is phenomenally successful. Firms have reported that some 183 billion of these investments has already flowed into projects that benefit the South African economy. This shows that our country is still an attractive investment destination for both local and offshore companies. We have worked to facilitate investment by increasing the ease of doing business, including by making it easier to start a business. This is one area that had slipped backwards. And we've been doing quite a lot of work to ensure that the ease of doing business is boosted so that Investors, business people can easily come to our country, set up companies, and start business. In the past year, more than 125,000 new companies have been registered through the BIS portal platform, completing their registration in just a matter of hours from the comfort of their homes or their offices. And now it happens just like that in a flash. We are making it easier for business to do business. Good afternoon to our viewers at home. My name is Sibylle Lombulani, and we are, of course, coming to you live this afternoon from Parliament TV in Cape Town. That was uh, just an insert of what the president spoke to in relation to issues of um, revitalizing the economy and reactivating the economy, particularly in this current context that we're finding ourselves in uh, of COVID-19. Um, colleagues, I think, let me start with you, Valerie, because I know that you were burning to say something <laughs> as we were getting into the discussion about, about the economy. What are your views in relation to the pronouncements that were made by the president, particularly in terms of localizing uh, the implementation of the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. Uh, thank you very much. I think well, the viewers at home, even most of the people that were watching, it, it actually hit home to say finally South Africa is going to do something about rejuvenating our local uh, products and grow our economy locally. <clears throat> and also one of the things that I like is that what the president said and how he's going to accelerate economic recovery plan, spoke 
throughout the debate. You can see a streamline even in the debates that were made by the members <coughs> of parliament in their different uh, uh, positions. But one thing that I liked in what the president said, this is the four is the master plan. Mm -hmm. He highlighted four critical points that will assist in the growth of our, of our local economy. One of them was the poultry master plan. We know that the poultry master plan, it's, it's something that people find it very easy to develop their economy. Absolutely. And I think you, all of us here, colleagues, at some point we know somebody in our community that is actually yeah, breeding poultry. So that is one of the critical areas. And the president said 800 billion has been invested to ensure that we grow this industry. You might recall that at some point South Africa was receiving uh, chicken from Brazil. And, and, and I believe America as well. So we have Absolutely. realized that we had our own rainbows. We had the rainbow that was located in KZN, and the people lost jobs once, that, once those firms closed. So bringing back that poultry, the poultry industry to the local people is really going to bring back the economy and closer to the people. And another one is the sugarcane master plan. In the sugar cane master plan, there's a commitment to say that 80% of any sugar that is produced must be local. And Valeria, I don't know, guys, if all of them goes. Valeria, I, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that <clears> because uh, 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 these businesses, you remember that uh, when you were addressing, you also uh, made uh, an undertaking that... Uh, 1.3 uh, billion uh, from the relief package of 500 billion mm. should go uh, 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 to the should should go to the businesses that, that are owned by women. Mm. And uh, uh, growing mm. up, Elokshini, uh, uh, e businesses mostly uh, the poultry businesses that mm. we are talking about. Mm. Even the local mm. ones, as Tenga goes every Thursday in Kukimile Kwaye, those businesses are mostly ran by women. Mm. Mm. So uh, it's great to see this uh, great mm. empowerment uh, mm. uh, of women, and mm. uh, you cannot empower if a Kumali gets his views. It is indeed, indeed. Just it, it, a great, a great um, um, empowerment yes. drive. Yes. Mm. Uh, come in, come in. Uh, you can, you yeah. can Thank you. Up, uh, so Sorry. that I don't lose my thought yes, on this particular point. And another very important critical thing is the sugar cane master plan. Most of us have been to Devon. We have flown over those hectares and hectares of sugar cane. And that industry, at some point, it kind of went down the drain. Mm. But now with this master plan that the president is introducing, it's now saying, let's, let's go back, let's revive the economy, because the infrastructure is there. When mm. you go to KZN, KZN, you will see factories closed that used to produce sugar. So if we can go back and mm. then revive and maybe upgrade it to meet the standards yeah. that are used in it, the world. Perhaps let's, let's bring in Shisla mm. Mariso, it, what's your take in, in it, relation it's, it's to that? It's interesting. The issue of industrialization is a key driver of economic recovery, exactly. obviously. Mm -hmm. And what I, I always find interesting, it's the budgeting aspect towards this uh, uh, development. Mm. Uh, I'm very interested in the uh, local sphere of government and the involvement of rural communities in these initiatives because we, we have an instance where, um, as the, the president of Salga uh, touched on yesterday, mm. that mm. the local government receives about 9.1% of mm. the total of the budget. Yes. Meanwhile, they carry about 46% of the constitutional mandate, Absolutely. you know, so that, that's that there's this uh, budgeting that's not proportional to the services that they have to offer. So it comes back to the issue of proportional budgeting mm. as well, because now uh, government says they want uh, service delivery to be about improved. forty percent yes. of its mm. uh, 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 procurement to go to local businesses. Mm. But then these local businesses are located within municipalities and that's where the district development plan needs to come to life. Mm. Because okay. then when this budget cascade from the national level down to the local level, then these industries at local level, if the municipalities begin to spend on the uh, local businesses, 
then we have a, a, an economic boom and it starts at that level. And I think if, if this finds expression in the budget speech, perhaps we, we could see an interesting uh, overturn of the economy altogether. Tamil, I is, think, is, there, is there something okay. that, that you would like to add? Go yeah, ahead. Be, before I add into that, I thought uh, I think it's just important that we remind those viewers who have just joined in that uh, this is a live broadcast brought to you by Parliament TV mm. and we are on Channel 48, DSTV Channel 48 and this is a build up to the president responses to the debates that took uh, that happened in the past two days which uh, she took about uh, 11 hours uh, to be exact 11 hours of debate mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. president of the uh, of the, uh, of the state of the nation address of the president so yeah, Sibu. Viewers at home, I think it's also just important to, to inform you that we do have the president of the South African Local Government Association, Councillor Tembi Nkadime, who is, of course, ready to come and share the perspectives in more detail uh, what she spoke to in the State of the Nation Address debate. Um, so let's go to uh, the next um, clip that will really be speaking to issues of local government. We are proceeding with our efforts to strengthen local government and to strengthen local government infrastructure and accelerate service delivery through the district development model. The model brings all stake as spheres of government to focus on key priorities and implementation of critical high impact projects. Working with both public and private sector partners, government is implementing a range of measures to support municipalities to address inadequate and inconsistent service delivery in areas such as water provision, infrastructure build, maintenance. We are also focusing on the appointment of properly qualified officials at local level to ensure effective management and provision of services. In some municipalities, we have often found that less than well-qualified people have been appointed and all they ever do is to mess up. Now we are saying the days of messing up are now over. We want professional people to run our local government. As we prepare for local government elections, which are due to take place this year, we will need to adjust to the conditions forced upon us by COVID-19 so that we can ensure that the people of this country can determine who represents them at the crucial level. Welcome back. You're still watching Parliament TV, and I'm your host, Shitla Marisongove, and we come to you live from our Parliament studio right here in Parliament. Between yesterday and, and uh, Tuesday, we had a great time bringing you the live coverage of the SONA debate 2021. We have had a lot that came out of those conversations in the National Assembly, and we are now building up to the response to the SONA debate by the president, which will take place later this afternoon at two o'clock. And we will be bringing you live the response by the president. But then now I am joined in studio by the president of SAUGA, who will be sharing more about the aspect of the debate that concerns her and her constituencies. I'm joined here by Ms. Uh, 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 Tembin Kadimeng, yes. who is also the executive mayor of uh, Polokwane, but also the president of South African Local Government Association. Ma'am, welcome to our program. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to our viewers. Thank you for having local government uh, at home. Yeah, we are, we are happy to have you. The president has spoken about uh, how uh, the local government sphere of 
of government is going to be supported to make sure that uh, service delivery happens swiftly at a local government level. Can you take us through what this uh, district development plan aims to achieve? Well, I, I think there's one way to sum a uh, district developmental model. It's a model which is actually enshrined in the white paper mm. of local government of 1998. When municipalities were formulated, mm. they were given categories, and there are three in the main. Mm. You have a metro, you have a district. There are 44 in number. Then you have got currently uh, 105 local municipalities. And that's what gives you the 257 texture mm. of municipalities in South Africa. Mm. We are wall to wall, which means there's no area in our country which is outside a municipal boundary anywhere else. Mm. And that in its own therefore suggests that the fundamental coordination of local government was espoused that a local municipality is under a district for efficiency, coordination, but also for, to create a one-stop shop which will assist in the district to manage municipalities. And in the main, we started in that program as local government, and I think somewhere around 2007 or so, a, a, a view was that, okay, let's also decentralize and see if local municipalities could be able to arrive enough by 2007 to be able to be standing municipalities on, them, on their own and be able to devolve the centralized power which were at district. Mm. And looking back, we now realize that that sort of uh, was a decision which was possibly not strong at the time or which was not necessary. I mean, local municipalities were not on their strength to be able to operate outside district municipalities. But secondly, it was duplication of tasks. Mm. Then you have got five technical directors, including of a district, you have five HR managers, including that of a district, etc. And it compounded the costs. Yet all of us within a small space of a local municipality will do the one section. So the president said, let's go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. And that's what the policy principle of local government is now, back to basics, to look at how we're structured and how could we ex enhance. And I think ultimately, uh, district development says one government, one plan, one budget. Well, at local government level, the thorny issue they it's the issue of budgeting, or let, let's say, for instance, the issue of revenue collection in oh, yes. general, and uh, particularly for rural municipalities, yeah. like at a very local level. And you spoke uh, passionately yesterday about the fact that local government receives only 9.1% share of the of total the budget. budget. Yeah. Meanwhile, the responsibilities that you carry, the constitutional responsibilities that you carry are up to 46%. Yes. Like, I just want to check, how do you um, aim to advocate for proportional budgeting just to assist municipalities? Well, yes, the shortcoming of a debate is that you can elaborate on your factors, but you are correct. Mm. Besides the percentage, I think what will assist us as the country will then look into what fundamentally a municipality is supposed to provide mm. to make a user-friendly, acceptable living condition and mm. hygienic for that matter for every resident or household that mm. is within that municipality. You know, for example, in rural municipalities, there's no waste collection. Yeah. And then you ask yourself, this area, is, it's, it's filthy, it's whatever, but we're not collecting waste which means that area is not covered. So we are saying, as Salga, that we need to walk into municipalities further than grading them financially now, which is where we think the formula is wrong. Mm. And if you remember my speech, I made an example about a local municipality in the Eastern Cape mm. saying, and I chose them deliberately because when you talk about a local government story, the first challenge you, you face is legitimacy. It's how, how good are we taking care of our funds. They are having a clean audit, mm. clean, with no findings, for seven years in a row. And I know they are going for their eighth, and I'm certain they'll go for their ninth. But they are rural municipality. They are graded level three. Which means just because they are poor, they are relying only on make mm. a grant that comes from National Treasure. They are unable to pick up waste because they don't have money. In fact, 
their indigent support surpasses the equitable share that they get. Mm. So how are we going to unlock the people in that area and that municipality to even begin thinking about local economic development because they can't even hire local eco economic development manager to take out the municipality into the, So you've got to look and grade the municipalities appropriately. You go to anywhere, Pulukwane, for example, is able to collect rates and taxes. Mm. But the former Aranang was incorporated into Pulukwane, just 50 kilometers away from Pulukwane. It wasn't able to do that. But it was graded lower than Pulukwane, which means if you are a councillor, if you are an employee there, you earn less for the fact that the municipality is small and, and, and poor. So the funding formula actually makes the rich richer, the poor poorer. And I think with observation and calculation at one by one, what is your strength? What are your weaknesses? What are your responsibilities? The total number of the population that that local municipality service need to inform how it needs to be funded. Mm. Contrary to now where you say, yes, the, the formula takes care of the population in size and number, but it grades the municipality. But rather, look, yes, into size and number, but look into the needs and the responsibility. Connection, connectivity to water, for example. Some topostrophes are mountainous, mm. but you give them the same allocation and the same grading. So for the same kilometers, for them to be able to build the road, the, the terrain is different. Maybe it's muddy, maybe it's rocky. So you take more money to build a particular road. Yet in a particular area, for the same kilometers, it could be less. But why fund them more than mm. funding the rural that is mostly in the rural and bad topography and terrains? Fund them more so that they're able to achieve. So those are the inputs that we are making to begin to say uh, we need to fund uh, differently. But also we need to introduce taxes mm. even at rural areas. I mean, they are paying for electricity now. Uh, they are not paying for water because most of them don't have yet connections. That's understandable. But have you seen houses that are beginning to come up in rural areas and there well, are no property rates? Yep. So we are saying, mm. let's review our tax amendment act mm. as well and see if we can charge property rates tax in relation to the value and the service that you receive. So your property rate may not necessarily be equal to Mbombela, in mm. town when you are staying in Komati port a bit in a far rural area but mm. you will contribute okay i want us to now move uh, towards something else the, the president has touched on how different spheres of government need to effectively uh, and decisively fight against gender-based violence so i just want to check at a municipal level how are you as salga ensuring that uh, the policies that are formulated and implemented at uh, local government level are gender sensitive, even the budgeting as well. Is it responsive to, to gender sensitive policies? Well, not to the best that it could be, mm. but we are trying to respond to that. Mm. One, we have got a women commission that is present in every province's SALGA. It coordinates uh, women, it ensures gender policies, it ensures uh, welfare of women counselors and the women staff. But is that enough? Because it then needs to inform mm. the budgets of every municipality to be gender sensitive. But it becomes quite a great of a difficult when you are moving from a 9% that its main mandate is to deal with mm. the provision of services. And remember, budgeting for municipalities come from an IDP, which means it's informed by communities. You do get a community when you're taking a draft of a IDP and you say, we think we'd want to put two million there or a million or 500,000 for a particular to take care of this welfare of a, a, an ensuring gender sensitive budget. We need a special uh, focus office and, and employees who will be able to deal with everybody, including assistance with the, assistance with the police, but it is never sufficient mm. to ensure that it covers all the aspects of what will make a municipality, not only taking care of itself and its councillors, but also taking care of the external uh, a, a, a community that it's immediate and its services. So we do have such programs like that, but to be honest with you, I would have loved to see them 
getting more stronger, uh, getting them getting a more mm. allocation to be able to respond. That's to my question. Issues. Like, how can they be strengthened? Because uh, municipalities, for instance, are criticised for implementing gender-sensitive policies on an event basis. For instance, the 16 days of activism and the Women's Month, and it ends there. So how do we inculcate? But we do, not unless maybe uh, gender-sensitive budgets are not understood mm. properly. Mm. In fact, municipalities are there to service women in the main. Mm. Who goes to the bush if, to collect wood if there's no electricity? It's a woman. Mm. What do we allocate highly in our budgets? It's that. Who goes to the river to fetch water if there is no water allocation and provision? It's a woman. I haven't seen a man since I was born going to fetch a river. I mean, water in a river. Well, it's 2021. Things could be happening differently. So when you are saying provision of services mm. and takes the highest chunk of the budget of a municipality, mm. it is a direct response to ensuring that women's lives are made better. If there is no street light mm. at a particular corner in a municipality, who gets to be in danger more? Okay. There's another issue that you touched on on your uh, speech and your debate yesterday, uh, the fact that the local government elections are fast approaching. And you mentioned a very uh, important point about uh, political parties forwarding candidates that are well skilled in governance and who understand processes of government and governance. Can you expatiate on that? Well, I think maybe let's start it here. You're very correct. I mentioned that. Mm. One of the key responsibilities of SALGA mm. post-election is to capacitate councillors and ensure, one, they understand their responsibility. Uh, local government is highly regulated. They understand the acts and the regulations that they have to operate under and then walk into a council room understanding what is the role and the responsibility of what they have to care. So they have got to allocate and make sure that there's this gender sensitive budget. They've got to make sure there's water, there's electricity, there's everything that makes a life sustainable. There's economic development. There's, there's interaction between private and business, civil society, traditional leaders with cancer, all encompassed. We receive, we have got no choice of who are we going to receive. Hence I was saying it's a, fun, it's, a, it's a funnel. What you put in is what comes out. And it mm. doesn't change anywhere else in between the road of in and out. Mm. The experience we have just with the term that we, we, we are wrapping up now in August, it's a good five years. An example I made was about MPEC, which is our Municipal Public Accounts Committee. Mm. It could be interpreted as a scoper in your provincial and the national plan. We have still been training now. Mm. And that's the strongest arm of what leads oversight in municipalities. So the first question you have to respond to is when we are complaining all of us about corruption is municipality. Where is the stop gap? The first stop gap is internal audit, let's say they don't do what they're supposed to do, hmm. or they do what they're supposed to do. They hand it over, and MPEC must bring it to council and sanction. One, they do not have teeth. Two, the capacity and the possible understanding of the duty and application is minimal. Hmm. And that is exacerbated by the high turnover. I mean, five years, a huge chunk of the 80% that you have trained in the past term is out. You start afresh. They are young. They are There's nothing wrong with being young. Mm. They are junior. They are unable, including the system, doesn't allow them, for example, to refer a case to your nearest fraud unit mm. uh, for further investigation. So we are calling that the law must be enhanced on that side. But political parties, equal. it's just a small example, for example, of MPEC. Mm. But let's look at uh, Egurulin. It's one of our biggest metros yeah. in the country. Uh, I think their budget is somewhere close to 60, 70 billion. Mm. 
Now, if I can't read the financial statement myself as a counselor and understand it, forget about oversight. Okay. Talking, to, talking about oversight as well, I mean, a bill was uh, passed last year that prohibits uh, st municipality staff or local government staff, oh, yes. prohibit them from uh, holding political, political office. office. How far-reaching are the uh, effects of that bill? Very far-reaching. Hmm. Because municipalities are at the closeness of the office, in fact, that's where politics is as well. But the trend you get today is that you could have a municipal manager who is leading in a certain political party and in most instances come from the same political party with the mayor or the speaker or the chief whip. The political problems that are outside the municipality manifest themselves inside the municipality as well. The roles are bled. Mm. The roles of either in subordination, taking responsibility, ensuring that council is supposed to do what is, is, is mandated by law to do, gets to be violated. The bill is currently sitting for concurrence at the uh, uh, NCOP. And that is why our plea is, much as we would want to bring now, as the president has instructed, a capable senior manager who mm. meets the requirements. Mm. We are calling for a capable council who meets a certain form of requirements and understanding. Even if it's in a mixed model, we also need to ensure that the ground is so level enough that if you are a municipal manager and I'm a mayor, your lines are very clear. Particularly because I mentioned it that currently both executive and administrative functions rely with council. Mm. So which means I'm going as an executive mayor, executive mayors are reporting to council, ask for a certain type of those powers to be delegated to you. If I feel you have made me angry, I remove the delegation tomorrow. And there will be a instability mm. in those minutes. And it's, it's on the basis of that, that mm. would want to ensure that can politicians be politicians? It's easier to achieve that. Because our recommendation is to say, let it be at least give you a process of 12 calendar months, which is a year, to choose whether you're a politician or you're not. And if you want to be a politician, the elections now, go contest. Then you will move from an administrative, but an administrator must be an administrator. Yeah. Until we have dealt with what we are recommending, needs also to be reviewed that the powers and functions, both of oversight, can reside with council, which approves a budget, and then will say, oh, there's something wrong with this budget, mm. and also adjudicate itself on some of the issues that they've passed through them. So there's no player, there's no reverie we mm. are in the <laughs> yeah. same, at the same time. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Manana Tembi Kadimeng, thank you very much for your time, for joining us, and I believe uh, most of what you raised yesterday will probably find uh, expression in the response that the president will give later on. We really are looking forward to that. Uh, viewers, thank, thank you, you. Uh, for tuning in or for staying in with us. This was Manana Tembin Kadimeng, the pro uh, president of South African Local Government uh, Association, talking to us about issues relating to local government. But next up, we'll be joined in studio by the uh, uh, Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Manana Sylvia Lucas, and we'll be chatting to her about issues relating to gender-based violence and many other issues as we build up to the response by the President. Let's briefly take a look at this clip and then we'll continue with our conversations. Ending gender-based violence is imperative if we lay claim to being a society that is rooted in equality and non-sexism. When I launched the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence and Femicide in April last year, I made a promise to the women and children of our country that we were going to strengthen the criminal justice system 
to prevent them being traumatized again and to okay. Okay. perpetrators okay. justice. Now, to give effect to this, three key pieces of legislation were introduced in Parliament last year to make the criminal justice system much more effective in combating gender-based violence. To ensure that perpetrators are brought to book, we are making progress in reducing the backlog of gender-based violence cases. We continue to provide care and support to survivors of gender-based violence. In the State of the Nation address last year, I said that we would prioritize the economic empowerment of women. Last year, Cabinet approved a policy that 40% of public procurement should go to women-owned businesses and entities. And our several departments in government have started implementing this policy and are making a great deal of progress. Last week, we also launched a groundbreaking private sector-led GBVF response fund. Several South African companies and global philanthropies made pledges to the value of 128 million rand to assist in the fight against gender-based violence. Now, that was unprecedented. Over the next three years, Government will allocate approximately 12 billion rand to implement the various components of the National Strategic Plan. Gender-based violence will only end when everyone takes responsibility for doing so in their homes, in their communities, in their workplaces, and in their places of worship, and in our centers of learning, schools, universities, and colleges. Uh, good afternoon, viewers at home. I, I'm with uh, uh, the Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP, Ms. Sylvia Lucas. We know that the sectoral parliament is one of the key mandates or deliverables of the institution, and this mandate is within the hands of the two deputies of the National Assembly as well as the National Council of Provinces. So with me now, just to elaborate more on what the gender-based uh, activities have been in Parliament is uh, the Deputy Chairperson, Ms. Lucas, uh, Sylvia Lucas. Ma'am, welcome to this interview. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank mm. you for making the time to join us and to join the viewers at home. It's always good to inform our viewers and our communities about the work of Parliament and to make sure that people understand the role of Parliament. Better. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, while speaking about the work of Parliament, can you just give the viewers a brief uh, summary of what exactly is sectoral Parliament? Now, sectoral Parliaments, in actual fact, they have in mind to make sure that those groupings that would ordinarily not be primary on the agenda is put on the agenda in terms of making sure that Parliament do go to communities do go to the designated groupings to make sure that we hear their views on issues and make sure that government also get knowledge of what it is that our groups, particularly women, youth, people living with disabilities, children, and all of those that are important for us as South Africa to make their view heard. So that is the reason why we are having this different sectoral parliaments so that we can also involve not only our groupings, but also stakeholders that have got interest in making sure that we put the agenda forward. So that is why we have a program on sectoral parliaments so that we can make sure, because in many instances, issues of those that are seen to be weaker is sometimes falling through the cracks. So if you don't have a mechanism to make sure that their input is being heard, it is when you will have uh, the fact that you will find people being dissatisfied, you will find people agitated against us, against the government, because in actual fact, they don't feel that they are well represented. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, ma'am. Uh, following up on that, that sectoral parliaments are more or less annually or biannual. In this instance, uh, how did the how did parliament manage to navigate itself in order to make sure that they are able to host the sectoral parliaments last year under the conditions that we have of COVID-19? Let me first of all start by saying we have seen that there was definitely before the sixth parliament, there was a program of sectoral parliaments. What was the issue that people were not satisfied about is the fact that they felt that they are raising the issues, but they are not uh, adequate feedback, and they don't see that their uh, ideas or the issues are being uh, escalated to the necessary levels. So that was, let me first start there. And then we, in 2019, decided to, uh, uh, to begin or with, firstly, the review of the Women's Charter because it was 25 years, exactly 25 years after the second Women's Charter have been adopted by the women of South Africa in the coalition. So what we have realized is that we don't know whether in terms of what was happening, the, whether there is a response or there is progress or what have happened with regards to addressing the specific issues that have been raised at that point. I just wanted to first and foremost make that point. Okay. Thanks. So that gave us, when the lockdown started, it actually gave us some food for thought as to how we are going to make sure that we continue with our program that we started whilst we are locked in and we are not in a in a pro, in a in a in a in a process or in a situation where we can take this specifically forward and lockdown gave us an unique opportunity to take forward all of the programs that we have put on the uh, on the agenda and in saying that is that we we were able to mobilize people without bringing people to central points we were able to empower women by do, making sure that they begin to use technology to the benefit of being connected and also be, beginning to make the input in some other way as they have been becoming used to. So by use of technology, and it even made us much more productive. That is one thing that I want to say, because in terms of whatever we have planned and we had on our agenda, in 2020, the year of lockdown, we were able to achieve almost 100% of what we wanted to achieve. We had lectures, we had a commemoration of, 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 of commemorative days, and we had men's parliament, we had we, the women's charter review, we had youth parliament, we had women's parliament, we had children's parliament. Almost all the, the objectives of what we set out for ourselves, to, and even the mainstreaming of people with disabilities to be part of the specific programs without putting specific focus on them alone, but making them part of the mainstream of the programs that we have been running. So it was in actual fact a blessing in disguise for us to be locked down so it gave us an opportunity to achieve much more. Thank you very much, ma'am, for that response. Coming back to the issue of technology, you've just highlighted that you achieved more. Uh, what would you take forward in terms of embracing technology and also embracing the traditional trends that we've been used to? But technology, what has it influenced parliament to say this would be the way forward as we move to other parliaments? I, I, I'm always <clears throat> saying to get in touch with people physically is very important because in the end you can just do so much on a virtual platform and you can just achieve so much on a virtual platform. We still want, uh, particularly that's why civil society is a very important part of what we are doing. We still want follow up on issues raised by the women. We still want our government to understand better what it is that inform us. So the issue of technology became so important. I mean, if you see this Gogo, all of a sudden, although the children must still assist her, but all of a sudden she's able to she see herself on TV and then she's able to tell us about the issues that is, and you begin to understand better through technology what is informing our people. Just last week there was someone that said, I want to work and they say I'm too old. 
But when this person was putting her point, she was methodology, methodological and she was actually able to tell you point by point on current issues. And I was asking myself, this person, she feel she still want to work. People feel she's got an age problem. But if we take this person and make her a counsellor or someone that will work with people at a clinic, in terms of understanding what is the issues that is driving women, what is the issues that is driving a community, you can put this person in the ward committee, wherever. So what is also important about this thing is that you can identify other ways of making sure you utilize the resources at your disposal. And I'm speaking about the human resource, bringing the human resource together with the technology. You, you, you simply have endless opportunities and endless possibilities. Mm -hmm. And that is what is important. Uh, Deputy Chairperson, I just picked a very important uh, stakeholder in your response, the elderly people the senior citizens, what you've just said, because in our communities, even in the political environment, in, in local municipalities, there's a tendency to actually ignore this particular stakeholder, yet they hold so much wisdom and insight on a number of things. So I think at home, even the elderly people who might be watching now, there's a revival in their hearts to say, actually, I can also do it. But going back to the women's charter that you are to when we started this conversation. How far are you with the review? And also, what are your plans and what will be the final session of the review? You want me to speak about logistic issues, but I will speak about logistic issues because it's very important. So for, for where we are now, we are actually now busy doing KwaZulu-Natal, Mpumalanga, and at a later stage, we will touch the Western Cape. In finalizing these three provinces, it will be that in one year, in a matter of one year, we have touched all nine provinces. And we did it district by district. Some, in some instances, three districts. In some instances, four districts, two districts. But we did it district by district which gave us an opportunity to understand better from each and every district in the country what is informing the issues of women, how far in terms of our gender machinery, municipalities particularly at that level, and also provinces have progressed. And also then, in far of how effective the legislation and the legislative framework and the policy development of our government have touched people at that level. The Women's Charter started in our, and what we envisage was something that we will take the 12 articles, we will put it in front of the women, and we will hear the view in terms of, of their experience as to what. But it, 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 it brought out such a broad scope of issues. I mean, for instance, if you read the, the Women's Charter, you must go and read the 12 articles. Someone will come up and say, yes, indeed, there is issues of culture, mm. but we are living in traditional areas. So how do you marry the traditional rural culture with those that are in urban areas that, are, that have evolved from the issues of culture and tradition? Indeed. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chairperson. And one of the things that is ingrained in culture or in the way communities live is also the issue of gender-based violence Seriously. that women get to experience. Uh, last year, you hosted a, a, a second men's uh, summit. How is this men's summit integrated or aligned to the district development uh, model in terms of fighting gender-based violence? Already when the, the district development model started to begin implementation, <coughs> we had consultative processes with the men, the men's forum and SANAC with regards to how they are envisaging their work uh, going forward. One of the, the key programs was the men's parliament and they got to the men's parliament. And one of the resolutions that they brought already from the consultative forums is that the work of the men's forum, 
particularly with regards to gender-based violence and also making sure femicide and making sure that they address issues of young boys and young girls. They are going to tackle it from a district level. And it is actually, it is, it is befitting for what we have started with the Women's Charter Review, starting from a district level, but also the district development model that government is bringing in now, and then the men's parliament coming in and saying, but we <coughs> want to make sure that our program work out from a district level, and in the districts, we also want to make sure that traditional communities and traditional leaders become part and parcel of our whole program. So the, the, the involvement of men and the, the resolution of men to be part and parcel of our fight against gender-based violence and femicide, and also to make sure that they build good role models for young boys and they make sure that the, the young boy of today is a better man tomorrow. That is actually the whole program that will fit in at the district level, and from a district level, it will escalate and evolve up until the national level. Mm, thank mm. you very much, ma'am. Another thing that also brings uh, this discussion into play is the fact currently the Portfolio Committee of Justice and Correctional Service, in front of it, has three bills that address the issue of gender-based violence and femicide. Also, we also have another bill that speaks to children's amendment bill. We know that gender-based violence can be physical, it can be emotional, it takes different forms. The children, children, how is parliament going to include the voice of children? Because all stakeholders in, in public hearings, they self-represent themselves. How is Parliament going to take forward that children find their voices in the Children's Amendment Bill or any other bill that actually touches on children so that their voices are heard through as well? In our discussion of the bills to be amended, one issue that came out, or before that, there was a discrepancy with regards to who is seen as a child. I don't know whether you are aware of that specific debate that was at the current moment taking place. There was an issue as to who is seen as a child and how can the children represent themselves in cases of emotional abuse and other issues and so on. And we have said, that was our contribution, is that we need to strengthen our legislation to make sure that if they start to address issues, it should be very clear as to what it is about and who is this that we are speaking about. And that exactly was on the issue of, of the children and who is going to represent them. How will we make it possible for children without any comebacks to be able to speak for themselves so that when we say nothing about us without us, it also includes uh, the children. And that is why if you, I, I'm not, 100% sure which one of the legislation. But there is a, 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 a part where particularly children with mental disabilities is also being addressed very clearly in that uh, uh, amendment. But to make sure that when we speak about children, we know who we are speaking about and what is it that they can do to make sure that we empower them to be able to speak up, to speak out, and also that they will be represented properly so that we don't speak over the heads about them. So that is why it is very important that we must know that if we speak about equal rights, we speak about equal responsibility. And that is why we need to make sure that our legislation, our policies, but also our actions show that we mean it, that we want to empower everyone. Thank you very much, ma'am, because that, this conversation and your response to say actually the discussions have already started on the table because we know that our sec in the Constitution, sex, Section 16, it speaks about children find, being given an opportunity to express themselves. And the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children, it also indicates that children's voices and opinions must be recognized. And also we have the Children's African Charter, the aspiration number 10. It mm. also speaks about let the African child's voice matter in things that matters to them. So it really gives comfort definitely to the viewers at home to say our children 
are going to get to the point where actually they are recognized because even the constitution elaborates that anyone who's under the age of 18 is recognized as a child. But ma'am, what you have indicated as well, we have children who have mental issues that really need to be considered. Will they be able to represent themselves mm -hmm. or they need to be represented? Thank you so much for unpacking what the conversation is all about regarding the voices of the children. Uh, Ma'am, right now, one of the things that is it's happening is that the president on issues of gender-based violence, they have alluded to the fact that they have raised 128 million in order to make sure that the national strategic plan on gender-based violence actually finds a space in order to be dealt with. And as we speak is that we also have 12 billion that government is going to, 12 million billion that government is going to contribute over the next three years in order to deal with the issue of gender-based violence. How will parliament ensure that provinces are able to develop policies and budgets that are been gender-based sensitive to the women and children. Sometimes you bring another response to the proper response of, of, of a question. Last week, we were having one of our sessions of the, mm. the Women's Charter Review. And I think it is the speaker of KwaZulu-Natal actually made an input about the fact that the Commonwealth Women's Parliament discussed the issue around gender-based violence and how we, it is going to be addressed. And one of the issues that they resolved on is that branches of CWP, that is Commonwealth Women's Parliament, that is in each and every legislature, need to sit down and begin to develop ways and means, and that is policy, legislation, and also to garner resources to make sure that we respond to the issues about gen around gender-based violence. I'm just bringing that sp uh, particularly perspective into this discussion. Whilst we were busy with the Women's Charter Review, which I actually realized how important it became, because provinces began to understand what it is that we need to do because of the input of ordinary women as well as civil society in our sessions. And that is the fact that we need to have resources, but resources that will be properly distributed. Because one of the first questions that we got with regards to the, the fund, the Gender-Based Violence and Femicide Fund, one of the first questions was from someone that asked, how are we going to access this fund? Who is going to administer this fund? So that was some of the first questions we got. And I actually said we are not going to respond to these questions. We are going to give it to the Ministry of Women that is actually administering the whole process of the National Strategic Plan so that now they must know there is already a concern being raised by women, by civil society, as to what is going to happen. We can get excited that there is resources because there was never resources proper for the, for the work that ordinary women has been doing, but also for, the, for, for government and also for other organizations that is in the space of gender-based violence and femicide. And if you look at even the United Nations women started to say that but we need to do more. We need to have a program that will make sure that there is a global response to this pandemic because it's also becoming a pandemic. Because even when, I was just saying in another uh, gathering, when uh, COVID-19 become a common denominator mm -hmm. that equalized the world, mm -hmm. the pandemic of gender-based violence and femicide. Uh, Deputy Speaker, in the interest of time, my apologies, ma'am, for interjecting, but thank you so much. You have given us so much insight as to what is happening. Uh, viewers at home, that was the deputy chairperson, Sylvia Lucas, who gave us an overview of the programs that have been happening. Now let us see what the president said on energy. The fourth priority 
that I'd like to talk about of the recovery plan is the rapidly is to rapidly expand energy generation capacity in our country. Now restoring ESCOM to operational and financial health and accelerating its reconstruction process is central to the work that we have to do. ESCOM has been restructured into three separate entities for generation, transmission, and distribution. This will lay the foundation for an efficient, modern, and competitive energy system in South Africa. ESCOM is making substantial progress with its intensive maintenance and operational excellence programs to improve the reliability of its cold fleet. We are working closely with ESCOM on proposal to improve its financial position, to manage its debt, and reduce its dependence on the fiscal. This requires a review of the tariff path to ensure that it reflects all the reasonable costs and measures to resolve the problem of municipal debt as well. In December 2020, government and its social partners signed the historic ESCOM Social Compact, which outlines the necessary actions we must take collectively and as individual constituencies to meet the country's energy needs now and into the future. Now, over the last year, we have taken action to urgently and substantially increase generation capacity in addition to what ESCOM generates. The Department of Mineral Resources and Energy will soon be announcing the successful bids for 2,000 megawatts of emergency power that our country needs. The necessary regulations have been amended and the requirements clarified for municipalities to buy power from independent power producers. Systems are being put in place to support qualifying municipalities. Government will soon be initiating the procurement of an additional 11,800 megawatts of power from renewable energy, natural gas, battery storage, and coal in line with the Integrated Resource Plan of 2019. Viewers at home will welcome you after the President has given us a glimpse of what was delivered on the 11th of February, 2021. The President has just highlighted how energy is going to be improved in the country. Currently, right now, uh, Sibulelo, what is happening is that there is a deep uh, move or there's an encouraging move to say that municipalities now are going to have the power to actually source their own uh, electricity. And also already there's a process where people can actually apply to get licenses in order to make sure that South Africa reproduce energy that is also going to benefit the public. Absolutely. I think that that is such an important undertaking made by the president, particularly given the fact that we have such a, we've had such a lot of challenges in relation to energy. And energy and electricity uh, production really is so important because it really is, it also boosts um, the, the economy of the country. So without the proper uh, without a proper functioning um, energy infrastructure, um, it also obviously impacts on the economy. So those are indeed quite welcoming um, um, undertakings made by the president because ultimately it means that it is also in line with making sure that the infrastructure that will be required to support this new economic and uh, reconstruction and recovery plan, um, all those systems are being put in place. And also what is encouraging as well, Simulado, is that ESCOM, being the supplier of energy as well, has made a commitment that by 2050, they are actually going to emit, uh, they are going to actually eliminate, eliminate gas emissions because as we are aware right now, the climate change is a big thing. Absolutely. At the, at the World Trade Centers, as well as in world business forums or conferences, the issue is about climate change. If you recall as well yesterday, um, one of the ministers, Minister Creasy, 
he highlighted how critical climate change is because there is just no uh, there is just no law that can actually remove this but it's a responsibility that all citizens and everybody needs to put their hands together to make sure that everybody society communities live in a clean environment that has no gas emissions uh, what else can you add on that point i think in in relation to to emissions um, carbon emissions and also um, its impact on the global um, community Every country has a responsibility in relation to, in, in, in relation to ensuring that the, these emissions are being reduced so that the, the global community, the environment is conducive um, for us, for humanity to continue living in. So essentially for me, I think just in closing, I think for, it's very important also to always link up all of these development issues with um, the survival of the human race. So for me, importantly, um, it is the issue of ensuring that all of the challenges or the constraints that will prevent humanity to survive must be addressed. Indeed. People of South Africa, viewers at home, being a human being and nature, it's a chain. Absolutely. The other one cannot do without the other one. Gas emissions are man-made and it needs all of us to pull together climate change. So today we have had the president on Thursday and we have had the debates. Today the president is going to respond to your questions as well as the viewers at home. So it is critical that you take your coffee, you sit in front of your TV Absolutely. and just give yourself time to listen to the president because most of us as we listened to the president speak, we had questions and we needed clarity on a lot of issues so now we are going to move into the joint sitting in the National Assembly where the President delivers his responses to the debates. Thank you very much. There will now be an opportunity for silent prayer or meditation. Please be seated. The secretary will read the order of the day. Reply by the president to the debate on the State of the Nation address. Honorable President. Thank you. as well. <laughs> oh, I see. Because I got a jab. <laughs> I was testing it for the nation. <laughs> and it's safe. <laughs> you. Chairperson of the Council of Provinces, Mr. Mr. Am Amos Masondo, the Speaker of the National Assembly, Ms. Tandi Mudise, Deputy President David Mabuza, Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Premiers and the MECs, as well as the leadership of SALGA, 
thank you for this opportunity to reply to the debate on the state of the nation. I'd firstly like to thank all the honorable members who participated in this debate, particularly those who dealt with the, what I would call the substantive issues of national importance, issues that we are facing today. We welcome the many valuable contributions and suggestions, because there were a number of suggestions, and where they were sincere and practicable and constructive, we will take them to heart and see how best they can be taken up. We also welcome the criticism. Members of parliament have all the right to criticize, and some of the criticisms were laced with insults, personal insults for that matter, which I think is really not warranted and called for. Because this is a house which our people take very seriously, where we should engage in a very serious manner on national issues. We take all these contributions, as I said, seriously because in the end, they enrich our national discourse, our debate, and they will strengthen our response to the challenges our country faces. Eleven months ago, when we declared a national state of disaster in response to the coronavirus pandemic, I said to the people of South Africa, we shall overcome. I said we shall overcome. I said, like I did say last week, that we will rise. And indeed, we will rise. This is inevitable because of the strength and the resilience of the people of this country. Yesterday, this great and hopeful nation, devastated by a deadly pandemic, lifted its head, straightened its back, and welcomed a new era in our fight against the pandemic. Less than 24 hours after the shipment landed of the virus, the first COVID-19 vaccine, of the vaccine rather, the first COVID-19 vaccine was administered in our country. Our vaccination program, which is our best defense against this pandemic, has begun. This has happened not in a month, not in two months, but now, in the middle of February, just as we said it would. And this process is starting in a number of countries. Some started earlier than us, some are starting at the same time as us, and some are yet to start. So this is a process that is lifting many boats at the same time. Many said that we have neither the ability nor uh, the will to protect lives, and yet here we are on the threshold of a new era in our fight against the pandemic. This pandemic has almost become our enemy number one, but we have a number of other tasks that we have to address. And so, before we get to the business of today, before we turn to our plans, and to the immense work that lies ahead, let us give the courageous South African people the dues that they richly deserve. There are health workers and others on the front line in our country, and these are the South Africans who deserve 
to be recognized. And these are South Africans like Zoliswa, Gidi Josi, a nurse from Cape Town, who yesterday became the first person in South Africa to be vaccinated. She, like many others, have been in the front line, willing to even sacrifice their own lives so that all of us could live. But there are many others, millions of our citizens, who despite the difficulties this pandemic has imposed on them, never lost faith. They never lost faith, faith in their country, or in the commitment of this government to serve and protect the people of South Africa. And this government has protected the people of South Africa, whether we like it or not. I speak of the families saved from destitution, saved from hunger, the businesses, saved from closure, and the workers who were supported so that they could still earn and feed their families. I speak of our social partners in business, in labor, and in so civil society, who stood by the people of South Africa. We have led and will continue to lead this country through the worst crisis of the democratic era. We have done right by the people of South Africa. It is much easier to say in hindsight what should have been done differently. To quote Homer, even a fool may be wise after the event. Much of what we have heard from the opposition benches over the last two days was little more of name calling and mud slinging. But all I can say to all the members of this house that we will overcome, we will find it in ourselves to work together to overcome this pandemic. We will rebuild our economy in a manner that is more inclusive, that creates jobs, and that lifts people out of poverty. We will put an end to corruption. We will keep our streets safe and build a state that can effectively serve the people of South Africa. Now, we are undertaking these critical actions at a time of great challenge and great difficulty. Several speakers in this debate have emphasized the reality that we are still in the midst of the most severe global health emergency in more than a century. They have spoken about the devastating effect that this pandemic has had on our economy on our society and our people's livelihoods. That is why the vaccination program that has now gotten underway remains our immediate priority, starting with healthcare workers and then expanding further to reach population immunity in the shortest possible time. It is why we continue to implement relief measures such as the special COVID-19 grant and the UIF TERS scheme to provide support to those who need it. And there are many people who need the support, but with our limited resources, we can only reach those that we can. It is why we are forging ahead with economic reforms through 
the various programs that we've put in place. And a lot of progress has already been made, concrete progress in accelerating the implementation and shifting of our economic trajectory. And this is where I would agree with those who say the glass is not empty. We should see it as having been half full and getting fuller and fuller as we move on. As we undertake the demanding task to recover from this crisis, there is much about our country from which we can draw strength, hope, as well as encouragement. Sometimes we forget about what we have on the asset side of our balance sheet. We forget about the many endowments that we have as a nation and as a country. We focus and spend a lot of energy on the negatives. And yet if we step back and look at what it is that we have as our strength, and we've got many strengths, and these are strengths that we should find time to capitalize on to strengthen where we are capable rather than to break down even those strengths and we end up with nothing. So we have a number of endowments as a nation. Some of the speakers spoke about some of these strengths, particularly our ministers, our deputy ministers, and members of our parliament as well, including from the provincial legislature side, our premiers, our MECs, as well as our SALGA representatives. And as I said, as a nation, we have many capabilities. We have many strengths and attributes that we can and must draw on as we build and transform our society. Our people are our greatest strength. It is their grit, their determination, and sense of solidarity that has enabled us to endure this pandemic. It is due to their actions that this pandemic has not taken an even greater toll, that we are now able to work towards a recovery, that we are able to contemplate a time when we will have overcome this disease. This pandemic has not only revealed so much about our character as a people, but it has also revealed the depth and diversity of expertise in our country. It has demonstrated the world-leading capabilities of our scientists, of our research institutions, of our universities, of various agencies and public entities, but it has also revealed the strength of some of our companies and a number of our own citizens at an individual level, at community level, at family level. As mentioned in this debate, South African scientists and engineers and manufacturers were able to design and produce personal protective equipment, and thousands of medical ventilators within a matter of months to respond to a desperate need. A number of our producers for PPEs were even able to start selling on the platform that we set up at the African Union, and they sold to a number of countries on our continent, and this was born out of the capabilities that we have, the inventiveness that we have, and the innovation that resides in this country. These are things that we need to highlight and to be proud of on the asset side of our balance sheet. Scientists from the University of KwaZulu-Natal 
working with other laboratories, were at the forefront of the genomic surveillance work that has led to the identification of COVID-19 variants. Several South African scientists and researchers at a number of world-class institutions have been involved in the management of a vaccine of various vaccine trials in our country. BioVec, a partnership between government and the private sector, is using the vaccine storage and distribution infrastructure and capabilities to assist with the distribution of COVID-19 vaccine to different vaccination centers that have been set up in our country. And people have been saying, because they're doubting Thomas's, they have been saying, are we going to be able to distribute and administer these vaccines? Because they only look on the negative side of our balance sheet. They must also look on the positive side of our balance sheet and know that we've got institutions such as BioVec who are now rolling out this, these vaccines and who will make sure that they are rolled out in the most efficient way. Yesterday, when I went to Kailicha Hospital, it was like clockwork. The health workers have been well trained. The same at Steve Biko in Gauteng. Health workers have been trained, they are prepared, they are ready to administer this vaccine. And we've been hearing doomsday stories that there's going to be chaos and collapse and everything else. Pause for a moment, South Africans, and look at our capabilities. Now, these capabilities did not come by chance. They've been developed over many years. Yes, there have been mistakes. We've stumbled. We've risen up. But the important thing is to realize that we've been trying. We've been the people in the arena fighting and working and making sure that we improve the lives of South Africans. And that is what is important. So over many years, and but they've also been developed through working together with development partners, both locally and internationally. And the recognition that is given to some of our scientists internationally and the respect is just mind-boggling. We are an important player also on the global stage when it comes to things like innovation, science, and many other endeavors. Taken together, our national science and innovation system is a hugely valuable resource that we need to further and we need to nurture and we need to develop. We must support the commercialization of the products that come from this innovative fervor that we have seen coming through during the COVID period. It must lead to creating factories and manufacturing as well as creating jobs. I've asked the Minister of Higher Education and Innovation to put together a team of scientists to begin the process of developing our own vaccines so that we can deal with this, this pandemic and future ones. We now live in an era where pandemics may become more frequent in our lives and we must therefore be resilient in relation to diagnostics, therapeutics, as well as vaccines. We must develop the scientific capability that our country has demonstrated to prepare for the future. Yes, we must use our own indigenous knowledge systems when it comes to therapeutics. Yes, even developing our own vaccines we must use the knowledge that resides here on the African continent. It is very important. 
It is for that reason that I've directed Minister Nzimande to get on with the process, and I want to meet those scientists and say, this is now urgent. It is urgent that we develop our own capability and not be running around the world, scouring the whole globe looking for vaccines. We must develop them here and now. The success of our economy starts with the investment we need to make in our people, and especially our young people. South Africa is a young nation with a youthful population. Too many young people are disillusioned, they are frustrated, and unsure of where to go for support. But our young, our young people are also resilient. In just under a week's time, the metric results for 2020 will be released. This is a most remarkable group of learners who were determined to learn and to study under the most difficult conditions. They must be commended for their perseverance, and for their steadfast commitment to achieving their ambitions. As a country, we have identified youth employment and development as one of our most important priorities. Not only because the high rate of unemployment is unacceptable, but also because we need young people to grow our economy. We need to harness the energy of these young people, the skill base that they have, and develop their skills. But we also need to harness their dynamism to meet the challenges of the present as well as for the future. That is why we are providing young people with pathways from learning to earning. We are mapping the services available to young people in every community to identify gaps and target our intervention to the areas of the greatest need. We are expanding the funding availability for digital and technology skills and in global business services through an innovative model that links payment for skills training to employment outcomes. The Youth Employment Service that we launched in 2018 has created over 50,000 work experiences and generated over 2.8 billion rand in new salaries for the young people that have gone through the program. The employment tax incentive support uh, scheme rather supported well over one and a half million jobs for young people in the 2019 and 2020 financial year. This is a phenomenal progress that has been recorded in relation to employment tax incentive. The foundation for all these efforts is laid in the early years of a young person's life. This is why maternal health, child nutrition, and early childhood development are vital for the transformational process that government is involved in. That is why we are still focusing on the provision of antiretroviral therapy and working towards the elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. It is why, for example, one of the programs under the Presidential Employment Stimulus is to provide financial support to over 100,000 early childhood development practitioners to enable them to reopen or keep open their early childhood facilities. It is also why the COVID-19 social relief measures that we implemented are so important 
it is that support that is necessary at the social level that has helped our people get through this pandemic. The temporary increases in payments to social grant recipients and the special COVID-19 grant provided significant support to poor households at a critical time. The economy is already showing signs of a strong recovery that is on the horizon. Just yesterday, we received new results from the third wave of the NIDS CRAM survey, which is a collaboration among several South African universities. This is a very representative study at a national level, which has been tracking the impact on households of the pandemic since the beginning of this pandemic. This data shows that by October last year, total employment had recovered to almost reach the level that we saw in February just before the pandemic. But this, in a number of ways, is progress. While we await the release of new data from uh, Stats SA, these findings are a remarkable early signal of a robust and resilient labor market recovery. This recovery in employment is the result of both the phased reopening of the economy as we brought the virus under control, as well as the success of relief measures such as the UIF TERS that were implemented as part of our emergency stimulus package. It is these green shoots that we must now continue to nurture as we steer the economy towards a full recovery and further growth. However, there are several areas of concern that the study also found out or reported on. The same survey found a high degree of turnover in the labor market, which means that those who lost their jobs in April are not necessarily those who gained jobs in October. Women are working fewer hours and their employment levels have not recovered as robustly as the employment levels of men. This may be due to, at least in part, to the disproportionately more time that women spend on childcare than men. The data also suggests that while the expansion of social grants provided substantial relief to individuals and households last year, hunger has once again risen to higher levels than before. This is deeply worrying and concerning. It is evidence of an uneven recovery which risks leaving the most vulnerable behind. It also demonstrates the need to maintain some of the extraordinary relief measures that we put in place and to accelerate our livelihoods, supports, and employment programs. It also highlights the need to move with the greatest speed to restore our most effective social support programs to full operation, such as the school feeding schemes. Research like this has helped to inform our response to the pandemic from the beginning and will continue to inform our, the choices that we have to make as we guide our economy towards recovery. More broadly, our experience of the impact of the pandemic has shown the importance of the economic empowerment of women by improving the economic position of the women of our country, we can reduce inequality, 
the levels of child hunger, and we can also reduce poverty. It is when we empower the women of our country that we will be able to deal a real blow against poverty and inequality. We can reduce the vulnerability of women also to violence and abuse. And we will be harnessing the talents and energies of one half, 50% of our population more effectively to drive growth and transformation. As government, we are working to give effect to our decision to direct at least 40% of public procurement to women-led and women-owned businesses. This is important if we seek to reduce poverty and inequality. This requires not simply a change to procurement policies, it also requires that we prepare women-owned businesses to access these opportunities. Therefore, working with the private sector, state entities, and development partners, we have started with the training process of women entrepreneurs in financial literacy, accessing markets, and access to finance as well. As several speakers have indicated, the economic empowerment of women is being supported across government from small-scale farmers to cooperatives, from human settlements to tourism and to mining. The pandemic has sharply demonstrated just how much economic growth and social development depend on the nation's health. It has shown how vital it is that we should invest in our people's health if we are to sustainably grow our economy and realize the potential of this, our most significant endowment, the people of South Africa. The pandemic has also exposed the inequalities in access to health care and underscored the value of a national health insurance, the NHI. While the pandemic has further constrained our public finances, in many ways it has also enabled progress towards realizing the NHI and making it effective. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us how to work together to harness the entire capability of all public and private providers in the health space for service provision. The other area, honorable members, where South Africa is richly endowed in our, is our natural resources. The Feinbos that I spoke about last week is part of a remarkable biodiversity that is matched in few other places on Earth. We have the great responsibility to conserve this diversity of fauna and flora, but also boundless opportunities to use this ancient resource for sustainable growth and development. Now, using our indigenous knowledge to produce things like cosmetics and pharmaceuticals products to develop our ecotourism we are creating new businesses and new jobs while making a priceless investment in sustainability. Now, our country is a country of great agricultural promise as well. We are a producer and exporter of a wide variety of agricultural products. Our agricultural products are sought in many parts of the world. The investment we are making in agriculture and agro-processing will enable us to fully realize the potential of this great renewable resource. But to be successful, 
we need to align agricultural development with an effective and accelerated land redistribution program. It is when people have land that we will be able to realize this great dream that we have. We should not, as some honorable members do, see a trade-off between land reform and agricultural output. The two must be complementary and they must be mutually reinforcing. And we must use our own experience, not seek to import experiences from elsewhere. We must use our own lived experience here in South Africa to resolve the land question. Providing more land to many South Africans along with the means to productively work the land is not only about correcting a past wrong, it is also about building a prosperous and a more inclusive future. A future that includes everyone and not only some as has happened so many times in our past. The wealth that lies beneath our soil has been central to our country's economy for nearly 150 years. However, this wealth has not been equally shared amongst the people of South Africa. It's only been shared by some, and it's also only being shared by some who are not even in South Africa but elsewhere. However, this wealth belongs to the people of South Africa. We have extensive reserves of some of the most valuable minerals and extensive mining expertise in South Africa. Mining was one of the sectors of our economy that recovered significantly following the easing of domestic and global lockdown restrictions. We are working with the industry to promote renewed investment through a conducive policy and regulatory framework. This includes efforts to reduce current time frames for mining, prospecting, water and environmental licenses. Yes, investors have complained that it takes far too long for them to get their permits and their licenses. And I've said to colleagues that we now need to inject great <coughs> urgency to all this. To encourage the expansion of the industry, the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy has drafted an exploration program implementation plan. South Africa's natural beauty, its long coastline, its developed infrastructure and its rich cultural diversity have made it a destination of choice for travelers from various parts of the world. Much as we are a distant destination for some parts of the world, it has still succeeded in being a choice destination. We are mindful that for our international tourism arrival numbers to reach yeah. pre-COVID periods, or levels rather, the vaccine rollout and adoption of biosecurity standards remains critical. The e-visa regime that we've sought to implement remains one of the key enablers for tourism recovery in our country. Domestic tourism remains the pillar of the recovery of the sector, and we are encouraged by collaborative efforts by all stakeholders to grow this market, this domestic market, in an effort to save businesses and jobs in the tourism sector. Now, tourism has been a resilient sector over decades, and even during the pandemic, with the work that we are doing now, we are confident that the sector will survive, it will revive, and it will grow again. 
among our most valuable natural resources as we build a new economy are also the most plentiful, the sun and the wind. That is why our Integrated Resource Plan 2019 envisages a substantial increase in the contribution that renewable Bougain. energy makes to our country's energy Bougain. supply. It is why ESCOM is expanding and strengthening the transmission grid to facilitate the connection of renewable energy by participating itself in the building of renewable energy generation capacity. Now, those who've been saying ESCOM must enter this market, ESCOM is in the process of doing precisely that. It has the depth of knowledge, it has the depth of capability, and we would like it to play in that market. Apart from reducing the country's carbon emissions, and ensuring substantial water savings, our renewable energy program presents great opportunity to boost local manufacturing and job creation. Another of our natural endowments is our location and our geography. We are exploiting this through our special economic zones, using them to strengthen our industrialization drive and bring development to local areas. Now, if you look at how other economies that have now become big economies have grown, they started industrializing their economies through special economic zones. Now, our own Kucha SEZ now has a mature portfolio with one large anchor investor and the Tswane Auto SEZ has a major company driving the localization of components in the area. The Dube Trade Port is located at a key logistics hub that is well positioned to decrease the time taken to deliver a product to global markets. Using learnings from our own Koha SEZ, and as I prefer to call it Nguha, the Kuha Development Corporation is providing advisory services to, to governments and to development agencies in a number of countries on our continent. The project opportunities have been identified in Cameroon, in Nigeria, and Zimbabwe. Now we have developed this homegrown capability by one of our agencies, which is government owned. Another of our strengths as a country is our position in the global community and also on our continent. We are a country that is at peace with ourselves, but we are also at peace with the rest of the world. Over the past year, South Africa has been hard at work towards promotion of the African agenda during its chairship of the African Union. We have worked with a number of member states to develop a comprehensive and coordinated response to COVID-19 with a view to promoting the economic empowerment also of women and to silence the guns we have made enormous contributions in our international work. We used our position as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council to strengthen the ties between the United Nations and the African Union bodies, particularly in the areas of peacekeeping and conflict resolution. We are a sought-after partner at the international level as various players in the world seek to address a number of challenges and problems, they always seek us out. A number of our own citizens are already being placed in a number of places in world bodies and in continental bodies. 
the sustainability of our economic growth and development depends to a great extent on the development of the entire Southern African region. This is gaining increasing importance and is presenting greater opportunities now that the African continental free trade area is in operation. We're working with other countries in our region to consolidate peace also in countries that are facing challenges such as Mozambique and the DRC and others. And we have worked very hard in South Sudan to ensure that peace is also installed. The Deputy President has been working with various partners in that part of the world. Our country, honorable members, is at its most promising when these great endowments are exploited and relied on as we combine to create something that is altogether new as well as innovative. For more than a decade, the government has been working with various partners, including the private sector and academia, to develop the hydrogen fuel cell and the lithium battery storage technologies. This work serves two important developmental objectives. It offers the possibility of a new renewable source of energy, while at the same time establishing new users, new uses rather, and new markets for the platinum group metals that are abundant in our country. Hydrogen and the fuel cell technologies which use platinum offer an alternative source of clean electricity, while hydrogen allows for energy to be stored and delivered in a usable form. Through this Hydrogen South Africa strategy, government and its partners have successfully deployed hydrogen fuel cells to provide electricity in some of our schools and to build hospitals established as part of the country's COVID-19 response. Now, after a decade of investment, we are now ready to move from research and development to manufacturing and commercialization. We are establishing a platinum valley as an industrial <coughs> cluster which brings together various hydrogen applications in the country to form an integrated hydrogen ecosystem. This initiative will identify concrete project opportunities to kickstart hydrogen cell manufacturing in promising hubs. It will also facilitate the commercialization of homegrown intellectual property. It presents what I see as a great opportunity to build a local skills base and lead the country into a new era of energy generation and demand for its platinum group metals. Remembering, of course, that we are the biggest platinum producer in the world. Now, through this initiative, South African skills, technology, and expertise is being used to extract greater economic value in the form of new jobs, industrial development, and cleaner energy from a mineral that the country has in substantial quantities. We will develop measures that should be taken to ensure that innovators are supported in the local innovation and research as we move further with the production. And government will also be one of the uptakers. This is just one example of the boundless potential that exists in our country to build a new economy of the future. And this stands in our good stead on the balance sheet side of, on the positive asset side of our balance sheet. As several speakers in the debate noted, we do need to work with greater urgency 
and at greater scale to address the challenges that we face. That is why the State of the Nation address focus on progress and not promises. And those who extracted promises and promises and promises maybe read it otherwise. But we focus on the progress that we've been making and discerning critics when looking more closely at what we were reporting here, have been able to say, yes, progress is being made. There are green shoots. We never said that we are going to do everything all at one go. All of it, in terms of handling uh, corruption, local government strengthening the capability of the state, these are processes that I've often said we all need to work together to achieve. Our country has been in a difficult situation for a number of years. And I've invited all of us that we should work together. There is just no other way. And yes, I do welcome some of the suggestions that were made, including from bills that people want to propose and what have you. That's fine. Let's put it all in the, in the pot and let's see how we can work together to build this South Africa. Within, now, we are making progress, and within only four months of the establishment in October last year of this center that we set up in Treasury and working together with the presidency, Operation Volindlela has worked very closely with and supported implementing departments to resolve obstacles to the implementation of crucial reforms. The raising of the licensing threshold for embedded generation, the opening of further bid windows for renewable energy, the reinstatement of the water quality monitoring system, the commencement of digital migration and the process towards the allocation of the spectrum, and a whole number of others, including the focus on land, are all concrete demonstrations of the progress that is being made across government. During the State of the Nation Address, I said that we would publish the revised critical list, skills list rather, for public comment within one week, and I'm pleased to announce that the list was gazetted this morning. So this is already happening. We have entered what I see as a new era of implementation. But implementation and action. And let me say, yes, the criticisms that have emanated from various role players have contributed to get us to be more focused, and the work that is also being done in government has enabled us to be much more focused in doing the work that needs to be done. But in doing it with speed and with urgency to follow through on our commitments. I have spoken this afternoon of some of this country's strengths and capabilities, of how we have nurtured them and how we should continue to develop them because all too often we overlook them. We just focus on the negative. All too often we find ourselves detracted by the political intrigues of the day. We are too often overcome by the unrelenting pressures of the moment so that we fail to see the enormous potential that resides within this nation. And all we need to do at times is to sit back and smell the coffee and see that great things are possible in this land. And if we fail to see that potential, and if we fail to recognize our strengths, then we will fail to seize the opportunities that they present for building a better society. A week ago, I stood here. I was forthright about the severe challenges that we face as a nation 
and about the many crises that we must endure to overcome. I spoke about the pain and the sorrow and the hardship that so many South Africans have experienced and continue to experience. But I also spoke about our strength and resilience as a people. I spoke about the qualities that we share and the common purpose that binds us together as a nation. We share the same fears. We share the same anxieties about our future. We share the same hopes and desires. We all want to provide for our children and we hope that they will enjoy better lives than we have had. We want safety and we also want shelter. We all want work, work that is dignified and rewarding and we also want good health to perform this work. Throughout the history of our nation and our country, there have been those who have tried to divide us, to tear us apart, to turn us against one another, and to drive us apart. But we have always had more in common than that which divides us. Most importantly, I spoke last week about the focus actions that we are taking that we are taking together to recover from the devastation of this pandemic and to build a new economy and a new society and a new future. Now, as we conclude this debate on the state of the nation, let us resolve that whatever our differences, and we may have many, and indeed we have many, let us resolve that we will strive together to overcome this virus. Let us resolve that we will strive together to overcome poverty, to overcome inequality and unemployment. That we will strive together to end violence against women and children in our country. Let us also agree that we will work together to build a new transformed and sustainable economy. That we will never surrender to state capture, to corruption, to mismanagement and complacency or despair. That we will never be discouraged or despair as South Africans because that is not part of our DNA. We are a resilient people. We are a strong nation, and we must rely on our strengths to get rid of our weaknesses. We must also resolve that we will place the South African child at the center of all the efforts that we make. And we must also resolve that we will get the work done. And I can assure you that after this debate, I'm much more invigorated, I'm much more empowered, and I will even work harder for the people of South Africa. And I would say, like the fame boss after the fire, we will rise. I thank you. Inspiring. Thank you very much. Uh, we have now come to the end of the president's reply. I just and woke up. I take this opportunity to thank the honorable president on behalf of this parliament and honorable members. That concludes the, the debate on the state of the nation and the business for the day. This joint sitting is adjourned. Long live President Ramaphosa, long live!
Following up on our commitments to the people, making your future work better. Parliament TV, Channel 408 on DSTV. Good afternoon, viewers. You are still watching the live broadcast of Parliament TV. That was President Cyril Ramaphosa uh, providing his responses uh, to the issues that were raised in the past, uh, in the last two days, uh, when uh, members of both houses of Parliament uh, were debating the state of the nation. Of course, the President has uh, assured us that we will rise, uh, we will overcome. However, we can only do that if we work together. I am sitting here at Parliament TV studios with my three colleagues who will be discussing uh, the, uh, the, re the reply by the President on various issues that were raised. But uh, what uh, stood out for me was uh, the President emphasizing that the key priority of government is youth empowerment and development. The youth is the future of this nation. Therefore, it is very imperative that they are empowered and that they are developed. And also the president outlined uh, uh, programs like uh, the Youth Empowerment Program, which was established in 2018 and its achievements, you know, uh, thus far. Uh, but colleagues, uh, I'm not sure of uh, what, you, what you took from the president. Yeah, that, that was quite interesting that he spoke about the youth employment drive and how he went ahead about how government aims to harness the skills uh, and develop the skills of the youth and their dynamism uh, to contribute to the larger program, which is to, uh, economic recovery. <clears throat> but also to note, um, he, he spoke at length about as, uh, the establish, establishment rather of the industrial drive of, of the hydrogenic uh, program to support uh, the energy supply that is in crisis, if one may say, in the country. So uh, it's very interesting that there are practical steps being taken to deal with the issue of the generation of electricity, especially uh, uh, renewable energy, to support <coughs> the national grid, because we've been having very serious problems in that regard. So those are some of the interesting key points uh, on what the president has highlighted. And also important, uh, so that the president had to remind South African of the strengths that we have. That was very important for me because at times we seem to forget how strong we are, uh, the capabilities uh, uh, that we have as South Africa, the innovation mm. uh, uh, that we have. However, I, 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 I'm sure you'd, uh, you'd hear and, that. And I so like uh, Africa, Zonga, Etikoro, Rotlama, Resoshnen, Loko, Ilam Talai, Umakona, 1994, Ingenaka, Karwashi, Democracy, Nalesu, Economy, Aina, Iyakui, Kari, Kursasona. It's very amazing. I mean, uh, uh, you look at how we've been resisting a lot of uh, uh, challenges that we've been facing as a country. And now how we've been dealing with COVID-19. Of course, there are pitfalls here and there, but we've been resistant to this uh, 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 pandemic. And we've shown great signs of a resi resilient people. And we seem to be coming out of this. And now with the rollout of the vaccine, we've seen the, the president uh, taking the jab yesterday. and. Uh, uh, officially launching the rollout of the vaccine, which gives us more hope that we will come out of, of, of this pandemic and we are going to uh, go ahead and rebuild uh, from where we left off. Um, I, I think another very important point to, to emphasize about um, if we just reflect from where we started when the president um, delivered his State of the Nation address and to the debate as well, we know that the president has focused the country on, on the four key priorities. Um, one, which is um, the, the, the response to the pandemic. Secondly, um, reactivating the economy. Thirdly, ensuring that all of these economic um, reforms that are being put in place uh, are able to create employment. And we're talking about sustainable employment. And the last one is the issue of corruption. But all, over and above everything that has been discussed, the, the president has focused the entire country on not 
too many priorities, but four key priorities to ensure that everything that we are doing, all the, the, the resources of the country and the capabilities that you spoke, that, that you uh, referred to, um, Tembikosi, can be really targeted and focused on ensuring that the plan becomes implementable. <coughs> But key amongst, um, uh, you know, overall about everything that the president has spoken to is the importance of multi-sectoral partnerships mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. ultimately the president does not stand alone. He makes, he has made the pronouncement as our head of state in terms of giving us, giving leadership and showing us um, the strategic way forward um, in relation to addressing all of these challenges that we have now, that we have to deal with in relation to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. But ultimately there are other role plays as well. And as we know, the next phase now, we know we will hear the pronouncements in relation to the budget and the budget budget next week is going to now allocate resources to the plan to make the plan <clears throat> implementable. Um, I think I'd leave it there for now. There, there's still much more to say, but I think, um, Sisval, do you have anything that you would like to add? Yeah, definitely. Out of all the positives and the programs that are already being implemented, as the president alluded to, he did actually not shy away from raising concerns uh, that have been highlighted through the COVID. And one of the concerns is that actually women employment has, no, has declined significantly during COVID. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that the, 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 social, the COVID-19 social relief grant needs to be strengthened and maintained in order to make sure that women actually are able to, to sustain their homes, as well as that the nutritional program that are being given to learners at school, all those programs need to be strengthened, need to be maintained in order to make sure that they assist women who are now suddenly becoming key in maintaining lifestyles in their and, families. And you spoke about the, 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 the importance of yeah, women uh, emp economic empowerment. Definitely. You know, because if if you put this abanda bango mam, I pelela po si ayas gutungo bani. Abacata Makaya with Sayas Gutin Gobani, Abanaka Kelabanduana, Sayas Guti, Goba and Abalima Massim way to Abogoti is always Abandabango Mamma Abahambu. So if you can empower women economically, that would, then you've done it because you'd, be, you'd then be empowering uh, the nation. Mm. Yeah. Doesn't it also mm. then speak to the issue of, of, of capability as well? The, the the president has of course given us a sound plan. There is no doubt that the plan itself is a sound plan, but ultimately we need all of these key stakeholders to play a part. And as you rightfully also pointed out, Sisby, that um, the president didn't shy away from mm. talking mm. about the challenges before us. He gave us a statistical overview around issues of unemployment and poverty in the country, which is, uh, yeah. of course have mm. been deepened as mm. a result of the COVID-19 mm. pandemic. And then he also emphasized on the importance of building and strengthening the capability of the state um, yeah. to be able to implement um, this elaborate plan, this, this plan that must take us forward. Yeah. What would you like yeah, to add? Talking about reason? implementation, in the next few weeks, we'll see the provinces also delivering their state of the provinces address. And I hope in those uh, uh, addresses, that's where we can begin to see this national plan that the president has delivered mm. cascading down to local government level and i believe that's where we can see begin to see the breakdown of how uh, the government uh, at local level is going to implement uh, some of these re reforms and the undertakings absolutely uh, you, we, we've talked at length earlier on and also the president was referring mm. to uh, the, the, the the procurement drive by government to make sure that 40% of its procurement, um, it's, it's, it's directed at businesses that are owned by women. Mm. So imagine if that would happen at a local government level. Mm. So Baba Sati, Baba Shaisa Kumakaya, my business, Yawana Kumema Bins, Yawana, Yakota Kushava Kumema Bashaverua Imaspal. So already they would have a lot of support from their municipalities. And if a small business, is getting uh, the full support from its local municipality and it's woman owned. You know, you are not only feeding one person, you are feeding the entire community because women are custodians and they take care of families. Indeed, Absolutely. also in terms of business progression mm. and revival of business, we know that business can be there, mm. but you need the labor 
Mm. You needed the workforce. Mm. And then that brings us to the fact that the president highlighted that the national health insurance needs to be fast-tracked. Mm. Because as much as the business opportunities are there, work is there, but if the people that are supposed to be there are not well because finances, they cannot go to a private hospital because the hospital is far, then it means that as soon as we address the issue, of the national health insurance, then we can have a workforce and a community of South Africa that is well, uh, well health-wise and recover well as well. Mm. Because other people die on the way to hospital mm. because the funds mm. are not there. They don't have private medical aid. So I'm looking forward to that day when Indeed. the national health insurance Indeed. becomes a law. The president also spoke about, um, you know, the localization of the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. And there was also an indication that 1,000 products um, would then uh, be, there will be space created for SMMEs to bring forward 1,000 products. Mm. Now, another very important um, issue that we need to look at in terms of oversight is about, it's not just about the products, but it's about who's actually producing these products. Mm. So from an oversight perspective, we also need to uh, zone in on the role of Parliament. Parliament is a very important role to play if we're talking about addressing structural constraints mm. in mm. the economy and making sure, so it's not just about saying that the economy is functioning, all of these products um, are now available and they're locally produced. The question that we have to be asking is, what is the allocation? From, like, I mean, without becoming, without making it a, a racial, but ultimately, if we're looking at the history of the country and where we are right now, mm -hmm. the people who are mostly disproportionately affected by poverty and inequality and even by the, the impact of the, the pandemic, um, it, it is those previously disadvantaged mm -hmm. communities. So mm -hmm. from an oversight perspective, it then becomes quite critical for Parliament to ensure, mm -hmm. um, particularly your, your, you know, your economic um, cluster um, committees, to ensure that when it comes to the production um, of these uh, products, these 1,000 products, we <coughs> must make sure there has to be um, 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 oversight to ensure that all of these products, they are evenly spread across mm. the districts of the country from a localization perspective. And secondly, um, it must not be those big companies that have been dominating mm. um, um, the, the economic landscape for, for, for decades and decades. And Lelo, Jangbao I Parliament in a role in Kulungu, because uh, Absolutely. So if government in those land language departments obviously very soon so basically tape lisha annual performance plans as a way the committees when parliament will then scrutinize those Absolutely. to see that what uh, uh, was said to uh, uh, the South Africans uh, during this week is show near Bonacala, Pagosa APPs. So, I Polanyan, I good parliament. No, it's, it's very true. And I think parliament now has a, a very important resource in terms of oversight. Uh, we've, we've seen the signing of, uh, of performance agreements mm. uh, with ministers, which is which assist parliament in terms of oversight. There's something to hold uh, um, uh, ministers uh, to. And also, uh, I hope this goes down to all uh, spheres of government, where from your premiers, MECs, and, uh, and even local councillors sign these performance agreements, and then parliament then is able to uh, hold them to account in a way and, and, and in terms of oversight and using these performance, uh, performance agreements and also the other available mechanisms that absolutely that when, you, when you're using. talking about performance agreements is also um, the issue of, of, of um, consequence management becomes quite critical mm. because it's not just about the performance uh, agreement ultimately if there is no performance what what but are the happens, what measures yeah. are then put mm. in mm. place mm. Um, but that is for Parliament to also <clears throat> tap into. That is for the, the body politic, uh, the, the space of Parliament, the oversight space to really begin to articulate what has to happen um, mm. when certain, when certain um, um, policies are not being implemented. And it becomes even more critical right now because not only South Africa is in crisis, the global community is in crisis. Mm. So mm. oversight it's, it's so critical because it, it cannot just be that the executive is going to take responsibility. Mm. Mm. If Parliament plays its role, if Parliament does not play its role, 
ultimately there's also a view out there that we are that the, the institution becomes complicit for not having played um, um, an effective oversight role to ensure that but, but whatever systems are put in place You are, can see this role yeah. has been played by Parliament in Absolutely. many ways. I mean, if you look at the uh, uh, developments as there's at the Zondo Commission, Absolutely. you get to hear most, uh, most of the reports that they get there as, uh, come from the, the committees of Parliament. You know, it's what was discussed here it's uh, Parliament's oversight role that exposed most of the most. No, of absolutely. Case, so. I, I, too, I, I do agree mm. with, with what you're saying. Mm. I think we are a growing democracy. Definitely. This democracy mm. is 26 mm. years it's old. old. Yeah. Mm. And there's so many systems that um, still need to be improved. But what mm. is encouraging about where we are right now is that there isn't a shying away from what the challenges are. Mm. And the True. president is leading, Definitely. by example, mm. by mm. saying, South Africa, these are the challenges before us. Hence the, the private sector, everybody that has to come on board, play your role. Parliament has to, has to play, has to play their role, an effective oversight role in order to ensure that all of these undertakings that really affect not only the, the like us as individuals, every person in the country is affected, but can be positive. Which is why I think uh, uh, President uh, was very, uh, uh, mentioned it like so you could hear that it came out as a serious concern that there is a need for a serious attitude change Absolutely. Mm. on south, mm. south african mm. south africans mm. urged us to, to to consider changing our attitudes and start focusing on the positives Absolutely. rather than mm. always forget uh, focusing on the negatives so, so uh, you, 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 can, you kind of like urged mm. South Africans to consider that attitude change. Absolutely. Stop mm. focusing on the negative things and start focusing on, uh, focusing on the positive things. In that way, you are building a better life for yourself. Mm. Indeed, Tim Gossi. I want to speak of attitude change as I was listening to the debate as well and what you colleagues have been st stating. It's the issue of land, the issue that is South Africa is going to be producing mm. 1,000 products. Mm. And what Sibulelo said is that how are we going to identify? How is that going to be implemented in terms of being in the community? Then it brings me to the land of Section 25 mm. that is currently before Parliament where at some point land will be expropriated without uh, compensation. But what has been happening in the past is that people will be given land but nobody will assess whether the person mm. actually does have the agricultural skills Absolutely. does the person have an understanding of finances that are involved when you're running a farm so i do hope once we reach that space where we are implementing and the land is being released to the people if you want to work on the land, be an agriculturalist or being a farmer, are you equipped enough? Mm. Because we cannot just give three actors to Valerie Dambuza, and yet Valerie Dambuza uh, doesn't have mm. the understanding of what is involved in farming. So it would be nice that people start also changing their attitudes to realize that in farming and in owning land, that is another way of being an entrepreneur. And uh, uh, before you come in, uh, she, uh, Glenn Dutetongo says, as someone who was part uh, of, the, of, uh, yes. of that committee mm. uh, on, uh, on Section 25, especially when it conducted uh, public hearings in various provinces. majority of the as needy misbehaves, we as needy and drum shaba will be able to sustain ourselves because mm. with land you can fully capable of mm. sustaining yourself. Mm. When we take against for that, mm. no, 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 it's, it's very mm. true. Uh, the the issue of land is an emotive one, mm. but also uh, our people used to farm even mm. uh, before 1994, mm. before democracy. People used to farm and they lived lived off their land, so. Uh, what, what is needed, obviously, it's when this process begin to unfold and uh, uh, land is given back to people, you know, there will be a lot of su yeah. support required. Yes. But also, you, you look at the uh, district uh, development model of, mm. of government and also the, the effort that are, that are being uh, put in place to assist local businesses 
so that government procure from local businesses. If you link this to, the, to, to land, it just goes to show that if uh, people are given land and they have appro appropriate support from government, they can produce and sell to gov uh, 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 and they can have their products procured first by government institutions, you know. And once uh, a, 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 a self-starter gets that kind of support from government institutions in, in terms of procurement, then it's easy to build on that and begin to sell uh, 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 privately. So I, I, I believe... Yeah. No, I think that you're absolutely right. Thing. The land issue is, is so emotive, as yeah. you have both, both indicated. Is. And there's also a view out there that um, the previously dispossessed have been alienated no. from the land. And, um, and many a times those who have been alienated from the land because of dispossession, um, they're finding it very difficult to connect with the land in a manner of like remembering yeah. how mm. do you use this land, exactly. how do you, what is the monetary value mm. of the land mm. and yes. how can you make a business and a living out of the, out of the land. So mm. that is also, it's about conscient, re-conscientizing mm. um, those communities who will be receiving the land back about what you can actually do with the land because it's not mm. just farming. Mm. Um, there's various other, I mean land, once you have land, there's so much that you can do with it, whether it's, mm. it's like building on that land, but the land is a resource for life. You can never mm. go wrong with land. Mm. Um, that, that's, that, very yeah. that's very true. That's very true, Sibulelo. While we're latching on the issue of land, uh, if you've been watching the news and also reading the newspapers, you would see what women are currently doing with the land, single-handed women, mm -hmm. yes. how they are managing. And some Absolutely. of them are young women who are actually producing spinach and also selling to the commercial world. But also on the issue of economic recovery, it's one of the things I believe the Women's Charter, Absolutely. that it seeks to, to emphasize, to say women, you need to get equal opportunities. Mm. We know when we were growing up farming and working on the land used to be a, a man's thing, but now the ball has changed, the, the has world changed. Has, has shifted. That's so so interesting. to the women who are in Wazulu Natal, mm. get ready tomorrow because there is going to be a review on the Women's Charter that was held last year. So, Abafazi, a case at the end, see, I tell you what in his lungs, Alexa, Sangoba, he parliamente, umnyangolo, Oh, I couldn't go on going twenty nineteen. Oh, Mabel Bugaza is a piece into is into Abbas Tolayo, and as a shinch or good in Abo, but Bona Calebo, Mamma, Abana Mantla, good to Bangas Mela, Umanga Bukufiwa, Kusama business. Indeed, and what another very important um, one of the key issues that has come up from the women's charter review process. This young lady um, has, um, and you're talking about women who, who have now, um, who know how to use the land. Mm. Um, she has had inherited a piece of land from her father and she decided to go and study farming and everything related to agriculture. Mm. And she was then able to take the land that, that she got from her father and, and use it and monetize it in such a way um, that she's able to derive so much. She's making, there's so, such a lot of returns economically. Mm. Mm. So it really is the gender perspective when it comes to land. Um, it's also something that we need to, to really tap into because the issue of land and women, women's access to land mm. um, has also come up quite strongly um, in the Women's Charter Review sessions because women are saying that they are ready you know, to go and, and go into farming, but what they need is for municipalities and for government where there are pockets of land that are available mm. to be availed to them so that they can get fully, you know, involved in, in, in farming and so forth. Mm. Uh, viewers at home, uh, I think it's also as we proceed with these discussions, it's, uh, it's important just uh, to inform you uh, that uh, Parliament uh, has made a call for uh, <laughs> uh, public submissions. Uh, on the expropriation bill, uh, and uh, those submissions can be sent to Ms. Nola Martinise, and the email address is nmartinise at parliament.gov.za. It's nmartinise 
at parliament.gov.za. You can also visit uh, uh, the parliamentary website, www.parliament.gov.za. Uh, to, uh, to get more information on that, uh, particularly the closing date uh, for those submissions. Uh, colleagues, uh, <laughs> the president spoken, addressed the nation uh, last week on Thursday. Uh, the, uh, the past two days, uh, the past two days uh, there were debates and today uh, the president responded. Uh, what is left now is how uh, this uh, program of government that uh, the president outlined and uh, the members uh, debated is going to be financed. Absolutely. Okay, can, I, can I just interject, not interject, but just to add a point just before we move to the budget? Because I do feel it's also critical to acknowledge that South Africa does not live in a vacuum. Mm. South Africa is an international part, has an international role to play. Hence, we have a non-permanent city in the United Nations Security Council. And how South Africa is actually playing a huge role in the peacekeeping missions. And one of the countries that were mentioned is that South Africa is a peace, has, has been involved in the peacekeeping mission in Mozambique, and as well as in Sudan, and as well as in Congo. So we need to, to applaud the defense and the government as to how we are actually enhancing and collaborating with Africa in order to make sure that our continent remains a peaceful continent. And we do take our heads off to the men in uniform, especially our soldiers. And we know the role uh, the SANDF played even in the fight against uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, viewers at home, as I indicated earlier, uh, that Parliament is calling for members of the public uh, to make submissions on the expropriation bill. Those submissions can be sent to Ms. Nola Martinise, N. Martinise at parliament.gov.za. The closing date is the 28th of February 2021. The closing date for submissions is 28 February 2021. Now, coming back uh, uh, to what I was saying earlier on, uh, we're expecting uh, next week, Wednesday, uh, that uh, the Minister of uh, mm. Finance uh, 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 fin funds this program of government. Well, what can it's, you expect? It's time for government uh, to put uh, the money where their mouth is. <laughs> <laughs> so that's definitely what we, we are yeah. expecting from, from the, the, the Minister of mm. Finance um, to show or give uh, an announcement on how allocations are going to work because it's good and well when the president presents a program but then it needs to be funded mm -hmm. and i believe this is what we are expecting from the minister to tell us uh, where we are fiscally like uh, do we have the funds to finance mm -hmm. all these projects and all these uh, Absolutely. Um, the, mm -hmm. the, the programs that we aspire yeah. to and it's, it's very interesting that once he has done that then we'll begin to see, like I said earlier, the provinces uh, hosting their state of the provinces and making their own allocations, cascading down to uh, local districts and local municipalities uh, are doing the same. So it's, it's still going to be very interesting in terms of uh, these government programs going, going ahead. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, to, to agree with that, indeed, that the budget is so important when it comes to the implementation of the mm -hmm. plan because mm -hmm. the plan without the resources cannot be implemented. Definitely. And another very critical layer to the resources is, of course, state capability, which mm -hmm. is, as we know, it's, it's, a, it's a common thread that cuts through the entire national development plan, that it is about capability. And, and you would remember, colleagues, that the National uh, Planning Commission's uh, diagnostic report from 2011 highlighted, it indicated that um, government has struggled to implement um, policy key strategic uh, mm. uh, 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 policies um, and now obviously it's about making sure that the plan that is before us and we must also be reminded that the NDP, that the president, whatever he spoke to, it's still in line with the country's national development plan. So the issues of capability together with the budget is quite critical. These are all the, the critical linkages in, in ensuring that uh, the plan becomes implementable. Mm. Indeed, mm. and my interest in the whole of the budget is to actually see how much is going to be given to the COVID-19 uh, social relief grant. 
considering that it's been extended for, mm -hmm. for three months because already millions of people are dependent on that. So how is the state going to fund that? Is the private sector and going to also contribute into ensuring, in ensuring that actually mm -hmm. citizens that deserve of this, of this fund are available to get it as well? Because I know also in the news there's been the fact that persons with disabilities as well, whether they've mm. been concluded on the social relief, but I believe they are mm. as well mm. qualifying of this uh, relief grant. Now, just talking about the, the cascaded um, implementation of the plan mm. and the integration, the coordination of the work of this plan, um, obviously we know that the provincial sphere is an implementing sphere as well, mm. Mm. which shares um, concurrent functions with national as well. So the three spheres, they do share responsibilities, and we know mm. that there are some mm. responsibilities that are only implemented by the national sphere. But ultimately, this is about, it brings also into sharp focus the issue of um, coordination. How mm. is the implementation of this plan going to be coordinated? And in, 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 in within that ambit of talking about improving our, our, our systems of governance, uh, which is what the president spoke to as well, the School of Government is busy capacitating, um, professionalizing the public service, um, and also the local sphere of government needs to be more capacitated to ensure that there's people at, at the local sphere mm. who have the the capability yeah. to implement mm. and to no, serve the people at, at, at the local at the local sphere of government, mm. and and I think it's quite it's quite critical because ultimately, without proper coordination systems in place, um, this beautiful plan without the people, all of the role players and the stakeholders who have to play a role in relation to implementing this plan, if we don't all come together, mm. um, this plan um, is going to, you know, we, we will see half measures. It's, it's true. Like yeah. I, I was talking to the principal, uh, president of uh, Salga earlier, mm. and she did touch on, 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 those fa on those factors, particularly now as we are approaching the local government elections very soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I really believe um, once we start moving towards that uh, capacitation drive for municipal workers, for instance, at local level, it's going to really help a lot in terms of good governance and accountability. Which is why I think uh, the president uh, spoke extensive, extensively on the issue of collaboration. Mm. The, mm. He made it very clear that yes. government can have its plans. Government come up with good plans, but if we do not come uh, on board, all of us as South Africans, then Ella plan Gafana Jba in Gatako plan. I think that is very true, Tim Gosi, as Sibulelo was saying, because one of the goals of the, of the National Development Plan 2030, mm. we're almost four, four years away now from the, 2030. It's nine years. Yeah, it's, it's nine, nine years. years. So if we nine do years. not build a capacitated oh. state where all citizens participate Absolutely. in the development of the country, we may not get there. So it means the citizens are critical. Remember service delivery, it's about the people, but mm. also bringing people on board in your planning, in your programs, in the implementation, Absolutely. because it means you value them. That is why the model on the district development model is so critical, because mm. it says there is collaboration, there is sharing of skills. It's amazing how when you involved the communities, how when you communicate with them, the amazing things that they can do in terms of giving to uh, say, this is what we can do in our community. These are the skills that I'm offering. So it's very critical that that collaboration and resource sharing becomes something that we as a nation, we encourage because our history, remember, tells us that most of the communities that are poor or disadvantaged, there was no let me use the term indoctrination. Mm. There was no indoctrination of being patriotic. 
about your country, being patriotic, being a caring person. Those are the things that you were taught at home. So yet on the other side, in the schooling syllabus, the others were being taught you how to care for your community, how to extend care to those that you well. to those that you don't mm -hmm. have. So it means that when we speak of collaboration, let's also touch on the values, on the life skills that are going to take forward the African child, those people who are still young and those people who are going to be senior citizens, but how do we build this thread of saying, my neighbor is my sister, the other person is Absolutely. my brother, because mm. the success of this country also depends on everybody having the same value about each other. Mm. Just as I'm surrounded by very friendly and beautiful brothers and sisters, <laughs> uh, <laughs> colleagues, it has been great. Uh, it has been uh, uh, two weeks of uh, state of the nation, debates, uh, replies, uh, and party uh, broadcast. And next week, we're planning on bringing you also the build up uh, to the uh, budget speech by the Minister of Finance. And viewers at home, thank you very much for being part of this broadcast. He uh, broadcast here in Ubandu. Parliament TV is a TV of the people. And on that note, Riyali Bucha, Siabulela, <laughs> Following up on our commitments to the people, making your future work better. Parliament TV, Channel 408 on DSTV. Uh, I have not finished my check. I'll probably be making the, a full uh, update because I, I think wherever we are, we may find time to go and observe and see what is happening. I can indicate for now that uh, uh, in Port Elizabeth, Nelson Mandela uh, Hospital and uh, the other hospital, like. Uh, Nelson Mandela at the uh, Tata Academic Hospital, they will be receiving the vaccines at two o'clock afternoon. Uh, in course, Albert Lutu, Liguazul Nadal will be receiving at two o'clock this afternoon. Uh, Pelanomi in the Free State we will be receiving this afternoon. Uh, Rustenbeck in a hospital, a provincial hospital there, starting with the name Job, I would have to get and read that down. Maybe I'll be clear as to when that they are doing. They are receiving it this afternoon. Uh, the MEC from Pumalanga will uh, probably update us here in this meeting. Uh, and maybe the rest of the other uh, provinces we may also get to know as we go on before the end of this meeting. It, it may just be important as an oversight committee uh, to uh, maybe take a, a drive and visit and see that happening. Uh, I will be, Angazuma Mshengwa is quite far, but I will be visiting because Albert will be before the sitting, uh, if we do finish maybe around one o'clock uh, and just observe and see what is happening there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that is information that might be complete. Oh yeah, I know that in, there's Chris Hani Paragonat Hospital in Gauteng, but there'll probably be another center uh, for Honorable Ismail up there towards Pretoria. I will come to get the full information. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Mr. Hart, who has logged in here now, will compliment my work uh, in the email, in a sort of WhatsApp. Then I can really send it to the members uh, to hear this, uh, complete this story. Honorable members, we do have a long day, part of our sitting this afternoon but uh, I would like us to get going with the business of the day. 
we are doing province number seven to get an update and the progress on their vaccine readiness. The vaccine is already here today, starting this afternoon, and also their uh, handling of COVID-19 in their province. It's Mpumalanga province today, and they will have Northwest the following week, and the last province will be Free State. Uh, I will try in the middle, uh, towards the end of this week, to to suggest other programs and bring into you the outline as we had discussed with Ms. Machalamba, the program as it will have to unfold now. You might recall we just went into what we think were urgent meetings that we have just held now. And I'm requesting you honorable members to support the suggestion that I'm raising that we have a meeting on Friday to approve all the outstanding minutes of the meetings that we have held. I really request that we do so. The minutes are already in our, I've started asking Ms. Machalamba to send the minutes to our emails. So the flooding of your emails with the minutes is to request you to read ahead of my request to approve these minutes this coming Friday. It may probably not be a long meeting, it's about four or five items. So if we do, maybe within an hour, we might have really exhausted. But with that, honorable members, I welcome you and now request Ms. Machalamba uh, to indicate the presence of members here and then apologies if we do have them. Good morning and thank you, Chair. Present is Dr. Lomo, Mr. Munyai, Ms. Gela, Mr. Sokacha, Dr. Jacobs, Ms. Zeke, Dr. Harvard, Ms. Wilson, Ms. Ishmael, Dr. Tembe Kwayo, Ms. Chiro, Ms. Lengwa, Mr. Van Staden. That's all, Chair. I haven't received any apologies. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I do notice that in our platform, the MEC of Pumalanga has logged in. Welcome you, ma'am. Uh, we will be uh, getting a presentation from you with regards to the update on the COVID-19 together with your readiness to vaccinate. Uh, we will be glad to hear where uh, are you starting, where are you receiving your vaccines this afternoon? And then uh, the platform is to you now to uh, indicate in the, indicate who is joining you and the way you want to present. We did receive uh, information that you wanted to change the presentation. I said, no, you will update us as you go along on which slide you want to say this information now is no more 32, but it's 37, rather than to rearrange and change everything members have been with this presentation for at least a day or two. So rather